a wartime icon made famous during the Gulf War. A tremendous machine capable of traversing the most treacherous terrain. A menacing beast that inspired the civilian Hummer H1. This is the M998 Humvee. This is a 1988 ex-military AM General M998 Humvee, which served in either Iraq or Afghanistan, transporting troops and cargo. So where does the name Humvee come from? The US Army specified that it needed a high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, or HMMWV. You think with that name it would be called the Humvee, but no, just ignore that W and you call it the Humvee. How was I able to obtain this ex-military Humvee? I rented this behemoth through Turo. Click the link in the description below to sign up for Turo, and that'll give you $25 off your first rental. So before we get deep into the details of this vehicle, let's get a little history. Back in 1979, the US Army desperately needed to replace the aging M151 Jeeps in its lineup. AM General was one of three companies that submitted a prototype and was awarded a $1.2 billion contract to build 55,000 Humvees in 1983. Humvees first saw combat usage during the US invasion of Panama in 1989, but came to prominence during the first Gulf War. The Humvee's unique shape and muscular proportions, along with Around the clock news coverage of the war cemented its place as an iconic wartime vehicle recognized around the world. The M998 certainly has a menacing look to it. Overall, the shape is aggressive but purposeful. Humvees came in several different body configurations from troop and cargo transport, weapons carrier, to field ambulances. I had always thought the Humvee was huge, but when parked next to my lifted F-250, it doesn't seem that big. You get 16 inches of ground clearance and a 72 degree approach angle, which is just a fancy way of saying this thing can traverse some serious shit. The Humvee can ford two and a half feet of water and up to five feet of water with the optional water fording kit. Fording five feet of water is pretty insane. That's up to about here. You might need some scuba gear for the occupants. This example is fitted with a canvas top, canvas doors, and plastic windows. The canvas doors come off really easily, which is pretty cool. So you can have a little open air vehicle. Just like that. Underneath this big floppy fiberglass hood is a General Motors 6.2 liter diesel engine making, get this, just 150 horsepower. That's about as much as a new Hyundai Elantra. But it does have a fair amount of torque which allows it to get over most anything. Don't step on that. Don't step on that either. And if you could, please don't step there either. And with a huge fiberglass hood open, you can really get a sense for how beefy the suspension is under here. Thing's huge! Well, sort of. Lots and lots of space for gear, not much space for people. The interior of a military Humvee is significantly different than the interior of the civilian version. Let's just say it's a bit more Spartan. It was certainly not designed for comfort. The seats are bare bones with some thin padding, unlike the cushy leather seats found in the civilian Hummers. And while the interior of this truck looks huge, space for passengers is actually quite limited. The seats are very narrow and it's separated by this huge center divider. Hats off to the soldiers that had to cram into this thing wearing their full personal body armor. Not a lot of room for that in here. The dash layout is also far removed from the civilian Hummer. Big chunky metal switches adorn the dashboard ensuring easy operation. Right here's the speedometer. Only goes up to 60 miles an hour and you can see right below that it says over speed. Don't go any faster than 60. 60 is pretty optimistic in this vehicle anyway. No air conditioning. This is the heater control right here. No dual climate control in this thing, but the passenger does have the ability to close their vent. Right here is the gear shift lever. Interestingly, this vehicle does not have a park position. When stopped, you place it in neutral and engage the parking brake right here. And no, military Humvees did not come with a booming system. This is an aftermarket thing, obviously. 
Since this is a rental and I don't want to get in trouble with the owner, I won't be rock climbing or traversing five feet of water in this thing. Instead, we'll take it on some narrow back roads and then we'll drive to the American Military Museum in El Monte, California to check out some of the military vehicles they have in their huge collection. Let's go! Uh, wait, how do you even start this thing? What is all of this? Firing up an ex-military Humvee is quite a bit different than starting a standard civilian vehicle. From what I've heard, military Humvees don't require a key. So I'm guessing this key was added later when this became a civilian vehicle. So let's just turn that on. Put my foot on the brake. Make sure that the transmission's in neutral and the parking brake is engaged. This is not engaged. This is engaged. Now we turn the toggle switch from stop to run and we wait until this light goes off. Looks like it's already off because it's already warm. That's basically waiting for the glow plugs to warm up. And now we can start the Humvee by just turning this to the start position. Not so bad, you get used to that pretty quick. Let's get out of here. One thing out of the way first. You feel every bump in the road. I think you feel every pebble in the road. It's kind of like driving an old cement mixer truck, except maybe a little bit worse. Lots of vibrations, everything's shuddering and rattling, including my teeth and my brain, what's left of it. Calling the Humvee noisy is a bit of an understatement. It's kind of like having an overly enthusiastic jackhammer operator in your passenger seat at all times. And this is on some relatively smooth roads. I can't imagine what it's like driving this thing on the deserts of Afghanistan for hundreds of miles. Whoa. Acceleration is leisurely, zero to 60 and eventually. I think that's an official spec. But a Humvee isn't supposed to be friendly on pavement. It's not supposed to be friendly in general. The purpose of this vehicle was to carry soldiers and cargo and to be able to do it in areas that are all but impassable by ordinary vehicles. And Humvees did just that in Panama, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, and many other dangerous locations throughout the world. It may be obvious, but I never served in the military. Trust me, the U.S. Armed Forces are a lot better without me. I wasn't cut out for it. So I can't speak to how soldiers felt about the Humvee, but I did speak to my grade school friend Eric, who served in Kosovo and has a great deal of experience with these vehicles. He told me that he hated them. It's like a giant vibrating contraption. He wasn't a fan of how small it is in here. You're over six feet tall and you're wearing full body armor. It's really, really a tight fit in here. Given the opportunity to have a weekend of off-roading fun in a Humvee instead of schlepping through Kosovo, I wonder if Eric's negative opinions of the Humvee would change for the better. So it was getting kind of warm in there, so I figured I'd stop and take all the doors off this thing. There's no sense in having a Humvee for a day and driving around with the doors on the whole time, is there? But also I thought it'd be good to stop and talk about the perception of Humvees for a second. When compared to the M151 Jeep that it replaced, the Humvee was seen as a very capable and solid truck. But it ended up getting utilized in urban combat zones for which it was not designed. The Humvee was originally built to transport personnel and cargo behind front lines, not as a fighting vehicle. It did fine in conventional operations like the Gulf War, but the rise of urban engagement and guerrilla warfare meant the Humvee was placed in situations which put its occupants in peril. Without any armor, it wasn't designed to protect against small arms, machine guns, or grenades. Due to the increase of IEDs used by opposing forces during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Humvees were especially at risk. In the first four months of the Iraq War, 67 soldiers died in Humvees. Soldiers started welding scrap metal to their trucks to keep from getting killed. Eventually, up armor kits were hastily tacked on, which somewhat improved survivability, but the Humvee couldn't really handle all that extra weight. The up armored Humvees ended up being a reliability nightmare. Finally, in 2012, the US Army called the Humvee no longer feasible for combat. But many will argue that the Humvee was the right capability for its era. It's what soldiers had and they made the best of it. After decades of service in the world's most war-torn areas, the Pentagon started auctioning off Humvees to the general public in 2014. All right, let's drive with the doors off for a bit. So 
here we are at the American Military Museum. It's home to the largest collection of military vehicles on the west coast of the United States. I think we're gonna see some pretty rad stuff here, so let's go take a look around. This is ridiculous. Look at that thing, it's huge. It's always good to get a sense of scale for some of these vehicles. This marine tank right here is gigantic. It's ridiculous. I would not want to be in the path of this machine. Nope, this is not the police chief's vehicle from Stranger Things. This is the M1009 Blazer that they use for non-tactical operations. It's actually seen better days. It's kind of falling apart. And here is the M151 utility truck commonly referred to as a Jeep, which was built by Ford from 1959 all the way until 1988. This was one of the trucks that was replaced with the Humvee. All right, that's it for the American Military Museum. Let's head back to the Humvee. entirely positive history of the military Humvee. Is this actually a terrible vehicle? Absolutely not. While I didn't have the opportunity to drive this thing through a remote desert, it's pretty obvious that these machines are incredibly capable where roads don't exist. And for me, driving this vehicle today, without the negative history of having to drive through some of the world's most dangerous places without armor, I actually really love this thing from its unique history, to its incredible capabilities, to its menacing looks. So, should you buy an ex-military Humvee? Well, there's certainly no car facts on these things, that's for sure, but they can be had for a pretty fair price given their ridiculous capabilities. Is it easy to buy and register one of these things? From what I've read, it's not exactly an easy process, but it's possible with some determination. If you're looking for a daily driver that you can take on some weekend trails, you'll regret it within a few minutes. But if you want a dedicated off-road rig that can tackle anything, literally anything you can throw at it, a military spec Humvee might be a fantastic choice. And it's certainly way cooler than the civilian version. The military spec Humvees actually served a purpose, protecting our country and our allies abroad. And it's pretty special to be driving around in one of the very vehicles that carried the men and women that proudly served our country. That's it for today. I'll have another video in a couple weeks. See you later.